This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you, Reverend Father General, Reverend Fathers, ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday, as you heard, Professor Morris Whitehead spoke of the history of the college, which is now Heathrop, down to the time it was obliged to set itself at Stonyhurst. As I said in response to Morris's paper, those forced to flee the age looked back on it longingly. And they also looked back longingly on the Society of Jesus itself, which had been suppressed in 1773 by Clement XIV, there he is, Clement XIV's bull, Dominus Acredentum. Clement wrote, we declare all and all kinds of authority, the general, the provincials, the visitors, and other superiors of the said society, forever annulled and extinguished, of what nature soever that authority may be, as well in things spiritual as temporal. Well, you can see Bugs on who is infallible. <laughs> the, the blessed John Henry Newman once remarked that the suppression of the Society of Jesus was one of the most mysterious matters in the history of the church. Now, I have no intention of trying to unravel history. Many of the former Jesuits, however, believe that despite the draconian wording of the papal bull, the society would be re-established. It had indeed survived in Russia, and because the Empress Catherine the Great would not allow the bull of suppression to be promulgated, she needed the Jesuit schools for her Polish subjects. In 1803, the quasi-superior of the former English Jesuits received verbal permission from Pope Pius VII to aggregate the remaining members of his province to the White Russian province, or as it was known, Alba Russia. Father, Father William Strickland sent out letters to all surviving members. Now, this is the only significant uh, picture, really. The rest of the side, you don't have to look at me. In, 1770, in, in 1773, the late Father Geoffrey Holt calculated, there were in the province 213 priests, 28 brothers, and 27 scholastics, including eight novices. 40 of the clergy were at Liège, 134 on the mission in England and Wales, and 21 in America, which had been part of the English province. By 1803, however, some 200 of them had died. In the end, 31 former members rejoined. The figures, as I say, are on the screen here. The numbers given in bracket the top simply indicate that we don't know which of the two years, 1803 or 1804, for which they rejoined. They renewed their vows. A few hesitated, however, because papal permission had only been given verbally. In 1814, however, the society was formally reconstituted by the bull Solicitudo Omnium Ecclesiarum. There was no longer any problem about being a Jesuit, or so members of the former English province may have thought. In fact, as it turned out, their problems were only beginning. <coughs> I think I should explain, perhaps, that in England, up to 1850, the, the, the church was governed by people with the title clerics, prelates, with the title, with the rank of bishop, but with the title of vicar's apostolic. Uh, there were no, technically, no diocese. Priests are ordained to a title. That is to say, before ordination, they must show they have the means of earning their keep. Priests are therefore to be ordained for a specific diocese which will support them, or if they have their own money, on their own patrimony. Those who are members of a religious order, on the other hand, are ordained titulo pauperitatis, to the title of poverty, which means, in effect, that the religious order will look after them. But Jesuits could not formally exist in Britain until they had the approval of the vicars apostolic. And if those who studied for the priesthood of the seminary at Stonyhurst were, were ordained titulo missionis for the mission, they were, strictly speaking, 
at the beck and call of the hierarchy. Now Jesuits long had their own places of apostolic activity in England, even during the suppression, and the newly ordained might hope to be sent to these. But unless their status as religious was clear, the whereabouts of their service will be determined not by Jesuit superiors, but by the vicars apostolic. Even after Pius VII formally brought the Society of Jesus back into being, <coughs> some of the vicars apostolic continued to refuse to acknowledge the existence of the society. The problem arose, at least in part, because of Catholic emancipation, the regaining for the Catholics of the British Isles the full rights of citizenship. A group of laymen with the support of <coughs> excuse me, a group of laymen with the support of the majority of the figures apostolic were prepared to take an oath which, according to the most obvious interpretation, would have implied that Catholics accepted, indeed approved of, toleration for all religions. This, of course, was not official Catholic teaching until the Second Vatican Council and the English Jesuits and some others were not prepared to sign up to it. The most notable opponent of the oath at the time was the sturdy friend of the gentleman of Stonyhurst, Bishop John Milner, Vicar Apostolic of the Midland District. He, and I quote, resisted the willingness of his fellow Vicar Apostolic to exchange the right of veto over Episcopal appointments in return for Catholic emancipation, believing that it would compromise the independence of the church. The theological stance of the members of the society, in other words, was regarded by many as inimical to the wider needs of the church in Britain. With the exception of Bishop Milner, the Vicar's Apostolic refused to ordain Jesuits, titulo apostatis, despite the Bull of 1814, on the grounds that the latter unlike the Bull of Suppression, had not been formally communicated to them through the proper Roman channels, in other words, by the Congregation of Propaganda, which governs the Church in Britain from Rome. Neither the Pope nor the Prefect of Propaganda was prepared to bring pressure to bear on the English bishops, the Apostolic. These issues were crucial for the future of the seminary, Indeed, at the whole Stonyhurst Enterprise School as well as seminary, given that the alumni, the alumni of the school were expected to serve if required for eight years, if the alumni of the seminary, sorry, were expected to serve if required for eight years at the school before going out on the mission in order to maintain the teaching staff. <coughs> but if those offering themselves to the society and an officiate had been opened at Hodder, uh, Hodder Place, in, in, uh, close to Stonyhurst in 1803, in anticipation of new vocations. If those offering themselves to the society could not be ordained, what was the point of them joining? As Father Francis Edwards remarked in his history of the English province, never did the prospects of the society in England seem bleaker. Many of the candidates simply gave up for ordination, simply gave up and went home. As the hostility of the Vicar's Apostolic continued unabated, in 1820 the General Congregation of the Society, called to elect a new Jesuit Superior General, decreed that English candidates of the Society should study in Rome, where at least they could be ordained, titulo palpitatis. The consequences of the General Congregation's decision are apparent in the province catalogues of the period. They show a steady stream of novices from 1803 onwards, but only a small handful made the transition from the novitiate to the seminary to study philosophy and theology. There they were taught by a very small and undistinguished group of professors with no special training in the disciplines they were required to impart to the scholastics. <coughs> Not all the catalogues survive, if they ever existed, but whereas that of 1820 records three people studying theology and ten philosophy, the 1823 catalogue after the 1820 decision of the General Congregation records six studying theology in Italy and three likewise in Italy studying philosophy. There were three more theological students in Switzerland. Even the novices had moved 
they were now in France. In other words, the English Vicar's Apostolic had succeeded where the suppression of the society and the French Revolutionary Armies had failed. <laughs> they had shut the English Jesuit Seminary. Well, not quite. Otherwise, we couldn't be claiming 400 years of continuous history. There remained a small staff in the seminary at Stonyhurst, and it was back in operation by 1828, though with very few students. <clears throat> the date of 1828 is surprising, because the attitude of the Vicar's Apostolic had not changed. When the change did come, it came quite suddenly through the intervention of, uh, of Bishop Peter Augustine Baines, a Benedictine and coadjutor bishop of the Western District, who was sympathetic to the society's predicament, and who in 1828-29 was in Rome for health reasons. Oh, that I always think. He was, he was highly thought of by the Pope at the time, Leo XII. And when he sent Leo a note about the situation in England, he received it back on the 29th of January, 1829, with a note in Leo's own handwriting, declaring that the Constitution restoring the society throughout the world, solicitude of omnium ecclesiarum, did indeed, after all, have canonical force in Britain. This, at last, was something the Vicar's Apostolic could not ignore. But a degree of hostility remained. In his book, The English Catholic Community, 1550 to 1850, Professor John Bossy remarks that there is a Jesuit historiography, a Jesuit interpretation of the history of post-Reformation Catholicism in this country. He endorses that version of history, but he couldn't do otherwise. His brother's a Jesuit. <laughs> he was here yesterday. I don't know if Michael's here today. He was here yesterday. So John Bossy endorses the Jesuit narrative, but there are other narratives in which Jesuits are not the good, the, the good guys, surprising though it may be. <laughs> Had they not been ineluctably opposed to the oath of allegiance to the Protestant crown, the argument goes, the hierarchy might not have disappeared only to be restored in 1850, or it might have been restored earlier. That's one of the big ifs and what ifs of the English Catholic history. This view, however, that the Jesuits held up the restoration of the hierarchy was held by Henry Edward Manning, who was Archbishop of Westminster, would not let the Society of Jesus establish a school in his archdiocese. But that's another story. To return to 1829. It was, of course, the year of Catholic emancipation, but the Relief Act excluded not just the Jesuits, but all religious orders though only the Society of Jesus was mentioned by name. <coughs> These provisions, banning religious orders in Britain, seem to have been a dead letter from the very start. But at least until the 1870s, Jesuits in this country were taking vows in secret. It may have been this same desire for discretion that made the remoteness of Stonyhurst so attractive. You have heard from Professor Whitehead of the travails of the Nine Fathers who made their way there in 1794. When the increasing numbers of novices turned into an increasing number of scholastics, a new site had to be found. In 1846, the provincial was making a visitation in North Wales and was going to visit a farm, which, it seems, had long belonged to the Society of Jesus. <coughs> As Father Paul Edwards records, it was on this journey that he breasted Coombe Hill, saw our valley, and according to legend, thumped his knee and made his celebrated declaration of intent. Here I will build my theology. There's another more cynical version of the story which suggests that the spot was chosen because it was where his horse dropped dead. <laughs> the story, St. Bino's College was built to the Gothic design of the eminent Catholic architect Joseph Aloysius Hansen of the Hansen Cab fame in a remote, if very beautiful, location in North Wales, not far from St. Asaph in one direction and Rill, the nearest railhead at the beginning of the start, in the other. As the annual letters recount, 
Jesuit superiors have to write letters annually to the superior general. I don't know if he reads them all. I'll ask him afterwards. <laughs> as, the, as the annual letters report, this college was begun by Reverend Father Randall Lithgow, the provincial, and was completed and opened under the governance of Father William Cobb on the feast of St. Alphonsus Rodriguez, the 30th of October, that is, the date I always remember because of my birthday, <laughs> in the feast of 18. Uh, in the year 1848. It was established for the theological education of our students and begun under particularly favorable circumstances, namely with the very well-known theologians Father Giovanni Parone and Giuseppe Marzio, at the time exiled from Rome. It is located in a most delightful valley in North Wales, it is looking over the valley, and an ignorant, amid an ignorant Calvinist population. <laughs> one blinded by prejudice and given over to superstition. <laughs> Oddly, the Calvinist population seems to have been welcoming. <laughs> and the scholastics set about trying to convert them, <laughs> starting with the children. This was not easy, for the scholastics had either to learn Welsh, as, for instance, Jared Manley Hopkins determined to do, no, that's not it. <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> or teach their pupils English. Teaching their pupils English seems to have been the preferred option. <laughs> the province was happy to benefit from the expertise of theologians such as those just mentioned. It was relatively small in numbers, and although it provided lecturers, there is very little evidence that in the early years they were more than one step ahead of their pupils. The situation improved slightly after the enforced exile of the 1820s, and much more so from the 1840s onwards, when the political situation, first in Italy, then in Germany, and then France, brought continental scholars to these shores seeking asylum. There were some distinguished theologians among the exiles, not least one, there he is, Franz Xavier Burns of the Society of Jesus, 1842 to 1914 who taught canon law at St. Binos from 1881 to 82, and then later at the Gregorian University in Rome, of which he became rector. In 1906, he was elected the 25th General of the Society. The foreign scholars readily embraced the competitive style of their English colleagues. This style is exemplified, for instance, by Thomas Harper. Harper was, and I quote, Philosophy, a professor of philosophy at the seminary, Stonyhurst College, later professor of theology at the College of St. Binos, North Wales. That was how the title page of the first version of Peace Through Truth, or Essays on Subjects Connected with Dr. Puce's Irenicon, published in 1846. <coughs> That's how it was described to him. But he himself was anything if ironic, ironic. The dedication ran to our Holy Father, St. Ignatius, who has been thrice assailed in the person of his children by the author of the Irenicon. To, to him, this volume is humbly and affectionately dedicated as an act of reparation. He was rather more explicit in the second edition of 1874. Everyone who has read the first edition must be well aware that I am forced to point out over and over again the absence in Dr. Pusey, that's Dr. Pusey, who was a friend of Newman and Hurrell and, and uh, Keeble, over and over again in the absence in Dr. Pusey of those qualifications which are absolutely indispensable for anyone who takes upon himself the grave questions of theology. Not, it, not that Harper limited his attacks to non-Catholics. In a series of articles in the Jesuit periodical of the month, he was highly critical of Newman's essay on an aid, in aid of a grammar of assent. His objections expanded over nearly 200 pages. It was the seeming dissidence which he observed between the future cardinal's position, the future blessed cardinal's position, and what is, I quote, commonly taught at present in our Catholic schools, by which he meant scholasticism. As I said, the professors from abroad readily embraced the same polemical approach. In the 1860s, for instance, Paul Battaglia from the Sicilian province was sometimes teaching theology, sometimes church history at St. Binos. He had not long been in the country before he published 
the papacy and schism, strictures on Mr. Fuchs' letter to Archbishop Manning. <coughs> he quoted the said Mr. Fuchs on the first page, adding, assertions like this are frequent in books and periodicals written in the interest of Protestantism. They prove nothing except the ignorance of history, which still prevails among certain classes. He produced two more volumes, the first in 1868 and the second two years later. The general title for both volumes was The Pope and Church Considered in Their Mutual Relations with Reference to the Errors of the High Church Party in England. The last phrase had been printed in Gothic typeface, so there was no mistaking its import. <laughs> it was soon clear to the province authorities, however, that the remoteness of spinos was a problem. In 1802, the college's prefect of studies acknowledged that the isolation of St. Binders was deplorable. Professors could only keep in touch through magazines and reviews. He concluded that the theologate should be moved to a place more in contact with the life of the day. Then, in 1907, Father Burns, who had been recalled was now general of the society, said philosophers and theologians should be combined in one collegium maximum to be created nearer London or some other large city. Provincial, in 1907, accepted the idea in principle, though he told the general that a move was impracticable at the time because of the cost. It was not until almost two decades later that the general's instructions were carried out. And even then, the new Collegium Maximum was located not near some big city, but in the heart of the Oxfordshire countryside, Heathrop College, near Chipping Norton. What was purchased in 1923 was about half the estate of Thomas Brassey, plus the mansion itself, in all some 430 acres. Brassey had bought it in 1870 for 110,000 pounds, but spent that amount of money again on restoring it. The house had originally been built for Charles Talbot, the first and only Duke of Shrewsbury, who had purchased the estate in 1697, and commissioned Thomas Archer to design it in the Italian fashion. Charles Talbot, Duke of Salisbury, never lived there, and on his death the property passed to a cousin, Gilbert Talbot, who, as it happened, was an English Jesuit, and therefore could not inherit it because he was in solemn vows. The property, however, remained in the Talbot family and was sometimes leased out. For a period in the 1830s, the Duke of Beaufort, Heathrock, thereby acquiring a hunt. The college opened for business in 1926. To the original mansion, the society had added two wings, one to the left when facing the main entrance for philosophy students, one to the right for theologians. The real tennis court was converted into an imposing chapel with fake marbling. A static water tank became a swimming pool. A large and very ugly library was added in the 1960s. After the scholastics, English scholastics had assembled in September 1926, they were joined by those from abroad, 52 of them in the first year of the Caladium Maximum, 17 from the Upper Canada province, which was English speaking and traditionally at odds with the Francophone Lower Canada. There were students from Ireland, Spain, Germany, Holland, Yugoslavia, Brazil, Portugal, and 14 from three, diff uh, three different provinces in the United States. Even if the numbers were never quite as high again, there was usually a fairly large group of overseas students, except, of course, during the war years. No doubt they came from a variety of motives, though the desire to learn English was a common theme. Some were expecting to go, to mission, um, go as missionaries to countries where English was the main language, or at least the language of instruction in Japan, for example. Not that language mattered for their studies. A heat drop instruction and oral examinations remained in Latin until the late 1950s. <coughs> of Edmund Sutcliffe, for example, one of the two distinguished scripture scholars on the staff, his obituarist wrote, his obituarist wrote that he lectured with an efficient, flexible, and stylish Latin, which was much appreciated by connoisseurs, but not always by those whose Latin was a humbler variety. <laughs> <laughs> Alongside Sutcliffe on the New Testament, there was Cuthbert Latty on the old, the distinguished ecumenist Bernard Leeming, lecturing on sacramental theology, and the great Cyprian scholar, Maurice Bellino, of whom I was particularly fond. Uh, it's nice to have this picture because it's the only one you will see, I think, for those who remember them, of a Jesuit with his English wings. <laughs> totally disappeared, right? 
And of course, for six months a year when he wasn't teaching at the Gregorian University in Rome, the historian of philosophy, Frederick Copleston. The standard of learning was high, as was the rate of publication. But until the Second Vatican Council, the courses had perforce to remain dryly scholastic. Vatican II changed that, and coincidentally, it brought with it a new, an influx of new lecturers with radical perspectives. It was all very exciting, and Father Bruno Brinkman, the Prefect of Studies, thought others might be invited to share in the teaching and in the process to share the teaching and in the process to gain ecclesiastical degrees. So the Pontifical Athenaeum was born. On the 15th of June, 1965, Cardinal Heenan was installed as Chancellor of the newly constituted Athenaeum, dressed in a robe based on the portrait which hung in the hall at Heathrop, of the Heathrop Mansion, of Henry, Cardinal Duke of York, the last of the Stuarts, attired as Chancellor of the Holy Roman Church. <coughs> Brinkman delivered a Latin oration a translation was made available to the no doubt grateful guests. <laughs> but the Athenaeum was born only to die. The problems were outlined in a report drawn up by a member of one of the religious orders which had been expected to commit itself to the enterprise. And I quote, many reserves have been expressed about the Heathrop venture, especially as to the distance of the place from an urban centre, its intensely rural isolation, the dominant part played by the Society of Jesus in its conduct, the scholastic indigence of other congregations proposing to join as, join as compared to ourselves, and the final character of the ecclesiastical city it might assume. Crucially, Brinkman had failed to persuade the younger members of the Heathrop staff of the viability of the scheme for his ecclesiastical city to be built upon the Heathrop estate. The dissidents, if I may call them back, uh, call them that, were backed by Frederick Copleston and by the rector, Father William Marr, always known as Johnny. In a surprisingly short time, negotiations with the University of London were completed, and in September 1970, Heathrop opened its doors to all comers, at least to all those who wanted to study theology. Philosophy as a degree subject came a little later. In the former graduate training college belonging, belonging to the Holy Child nuns in London's campus. At least that's half of it. The transition from country to city was remarkably easy. The same cannot be said of the college's early years as part of the University of London. There was the question of identity. Technically, the Pontifical Athenaeum still existed, but as Copleston wrote to the provincial, it is an embarrassment. I recently received via the Apostolic Delegacy a sixth questionnaire from the Congregation of Catholic Education. I have not the nerve to tell the congregation bluntly that the Athenaeum has a chancellor, a vice-chancellor, two deans, two vice-deans, but no students. <laughs> <laughs> this disguised the bigger issue. What was the relationship of the technically independent college to the Catholic Church and to the Society of Jesus, or the providing body, as it was known to the college governors? Copleston and the Chair of Governors, Professor David Hamlin of Birkbeck, were in favour of greater independence from religious authority, while many, mem while many members of staff were concerned to stress the confession or allegiance. Heathrop, it must be remembered, was the first Catholic institution of its kind to enter the university sector, though others have since followed. The problem was dramatically illustrated when a lecturer resigned from the priesthood. The Vatican had ruled that former clergy should not be allowed to teach seminarians, and Cardinal Heenan threatened to withdraw his students unless the lecturer resigned, which he refused to do. Or he was dismissed, in which case the full weight of the law, not to mention the lecturer's union, would have descended upon the college. In the end, he was sent off to do further study. <laughs> And by the time he came back, Cardinal Heenan had been replaced by the less ideologically inclined Basil Hume. <laughs> the third problem, and the perennial one in most university institutions, was finance. In, 18, in 1980, the college seemed to be about to run out of money. Salaried members of staff were issued with, notes, with letters terminating their contracts at the end of the academic year. But then, but then Father Jack Marnie, 
the principal at the time, discovered that according to the college statutes, such actions were illegal and the letters had to be withdrawn. In the end, more money was found. The Society of Jesus committed more of its members to the enterprise and the college, in fact, prospered. In a very real sense, the college was flourishing. Numbers were growing if slowly at this point, and academic results were extremely good, helped no doubt by the fact that it was providing one-on-one -on -one tutorials, something otherwise generally unknown in the University of London. The move from Oxfordshire to London had been decided on ideological grounds. That in 1993 from Cavendish Square to Kensington Square was purely financial, when the rental agreement with the Holy Child Nuns had to be, to be renegotiated. A move to Kensington. Oh, it's Father Copston. <coughs> Come look at Father Copston. <laughs> a move to Kensington had, in fact, been considered in the early 1970s. I was taken there by uh, Johnny Marr. But the site seemed then too large and too expensive. Johnny Marr warned that Cavendish Square would eventually prove too constricting. He was, as usual, correct. Michael Kerwin has written, as it turned out, we would have been trapped in the site had we stayed in Cavendish Square because we could have not expanded as we did in Kensington. That's the outside. There's the inside. With students. <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, even the Pontifical Athenaeum has been revived in the form of the Bellamin Institute. Robert Bellamin, Jesuit and Doctor of the Church, is the patron saint of the college and has been in his time in Oxford. The college is once more licensed to grant ecclesiastical decree, degrees. So it raises the question, can Heathrop in London claim to be identified with the college established 400 years ago in Louvain? Would those Jesuit scholastics who first gathered at St. John's in Louvain find anything familiar in Heathrop College, Kensington Square, University of London? Well, they would undoubtedly be startled by the presence of women. <laughs> Other things would be more familiar. Some of the theology they might even recognize, though probably less of the philosophy. They were exiles in Louvain, fleeing the persecution of their faith, and aware that there was a very real chance that some of their number might be martyred. Well, a couple of Ethrop in London students have been killed in the course of their missionary work, in manner reminiscent of martyrdom, though no one's claiming that title for them. The Louvain scholastics, even those in the first century or so of the age, would be astonished uh, in the first century or so of the age, would be astonished to learn that the institution that prepared them for the priesthood and possible martyrdom in Britain now operates in this country under a royal charter and with a grant of arms. Yet if they poked about for long enough in the library, they might still come across some books which their professors had instructed them to read, some books in the library which were in their own, their own library at the age. They would find a shelf full of Robert Bellamin's De Controversies, for example. They would no longer, however, find controversy or polemics on the curriculum. Instead of theology, which is ecumenical, and the study of the beliefs and practices of other world religions. From Louvain to Kensington, it has been quite a journey. Thank you very much.